those of you sitting near the front row, I'm praying for you. Because, like, these buttons, you're just, like, you might have to do some, like, like Neo from the Matrix moves. You might have to be like, whoa, you know, like, because you might have a button flying at your head. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, and also, uh, next week, we have a baby dedication with Emma. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. Um, and so, if you have some babies that you would like to have that done, we, uh, we have a, you know, just a little bit of information. In fact, you could come to the Eats with the Pastors. We'll talk about it. Um, we just, just to know how we do things. So, okay. Um, so, I was thinking this morning that uh, the rotation of the earth really makes my day. <laughs> Luckily, I'm prepared for that. So, you know, a woman walks into the library and she asked if they had any books about paranoia. And the librarian whispered, I'm right behind you. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Now I can move on. So this morning, um, we're going to be wrapping up the series that we've done uh, called Relationship Reset. Um, I hope, man, I hope that God has blessed you and spoken to you. And even if you're not married, you're single, whatever, we all have relationships. And so I hope that uh, you found encouragement and equipping. Um, we did the uh, conference this weekend called Love and Respect. I thought it was awesome. Uh, we'll be offering it again. Hope you can be a part of it then. Uh, but it was good. Uh, Friday night and Saturday uh, morning we were here and uh, with a bunch of couples and uh, it was just good, man. It's just good. You know, how many know that as far as relationships go, things are not getting better in the world, right? And so we go back to the manual. We're like, hey, how, how are we messing this up so bad, even in the church? And so we go back and we look at God's plan and design and that's, that's where life comes. So. Um, so anyway, uh, it's been good. But like I said, we've been talking about relationships, love, sex, marriage. Um, today, uh, we're going to be wrapping up the series by giving you something that will help uh, uh, help you navigate your life moving forward. You know, I talked to a young lady this week. Well, she's in her 30s. But now that I'm 50, she has a young lady. <laughs> yeah. Just need a moment right now. Okay, I'm good. Um, and uh, it was just in passing, um, and uh, you know we, you know, just casual conversation. How you doing? And she's like, eh. and I'm like, oh, what's going on? You know, is it is it work? You know, is it at home? She's like, like, kind of like kind of both. I said, oh man, well, what's going on? And so uh, she just kind of, you know, started spilling, and. Yeah. Um, she told me that, uh, you know, at, over the New Year's, uh, her husband uh, gave her divorce papers uh, out of the blue. Uh, no conversation about it beforehand, nothing. I didn't see it coming. And she uh, just, you know, you know, she's tearing up and she's telling me the story. And, and um, you know, <laughs> you know, okay, first on the guy level, right? I'm, I'm just a guy, right? So on the guy level, I'm looking for the exit, right? Because like, here's a girl that's tearing up. I'm like, emotions. You know, I'm like, okay, you just need to calm down, focus, because like, God's got a moment here. But I'm also trying to think of like, man, what can I say in this kind of moment? Like, you know, spill over and just, you know, speak everything about marriage that I know. Well, that's going to be lost. And so just try to get resource her a little bit. Um, showed compassion, talked to her, listened, of course. And uh, but you know they've got a son; they're still living together. She signed it. She signed the papers because she wanted it was. She still loves him and wants him to be happy. If this makes him happy, and inside I'm like, oh, oh, I'm like man. And, I, and so in those moments, I just wish. And, and some of you know stories like this. Maybe you're living it, have lived it, whatever. But I'm like, dear God, there's people that are trying to do this hard thing called marriage, 
apart from your plan, apart from your presence, apart from uh, learning you know, God's instruction, and, and apart from a community that can help uh, move people through these things. I mean, we all, if you're married, we all have difficult and dark chapters, right? Right? Yeah. Don't, don't leave me up here standing like I'm by myself. <laughs> no, it's just you, Pastor. You just have a... Um, and so, and, and it just, it frustrates me but at the same time, I know we're doing what we can, and that's why we talk about these things. Like, uh, we want to give resource. We want to. We want people to experience God's best in, in their relationships. And so, um, so would you pray for this girl? I'm not going to give you her name, but that's okay. God knows her name. But just, it, it's it's never too late for God to restore what's been broken or even killed. He's in the resurrection business, if you didn't know. And so, um, so just keep in mind, if you would, um, you know, we, we did this love and respect conference because, you know, we lost money on the event, pure and simple. Don't care. It's worth it to invest in marriages. It's worth it. And it's worth it to invest in marriages, even in our community. We had some folks that are not part of Creekside come. Awesome. Love to invest in you. It's important. So, um, so today, we're going to talk about how to live life to the fullest, and um, we're going we're gonna to look at one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. Um, I, I've preached from this story many, many times from many, many different angles. Um, today is kind of a new angle from this passage that I'm going to explore, um, but if you would... You know, we've been doing some topical series, and that's fine, that's good, we need to do that, but um, there's times where we want to just go to the Word and examine a passage, okay, that expository preaching, sometimes topical expository, but, but today we're going to read a passage, and so I always want us to honor God's Word. If you remember from Nehemiah, how they all stood uh, as the Word was being uh, read, um, so if you would this morning, would you stand one more time? We're giving you your calisthenics, your exercise, some of y'all need it anyway. Like me, okay, I'm just do little squats here, okay. Um, but uh, this is what I want to do. I want to read this passage, and there's such life here, okay? Yes, amen. Okay, so, uh, okay, John chapter 4 is where we're going to be, verses 1 through 26. I'm going to read the whole thing. So Jesus knew that the Pharisees, those Pharisees? Uh, had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them and his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Verse 4, he had to go through Samaria on the way. That's important. He had an appointment. Verse 5, eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, oh, look, fully human, Jesus got tired, fully human, fully God. Um, So soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because the disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew. And I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew, dear God, how, how much, how often does God say that to each one of us? If you only knew, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. (laughs) She said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Verse 12, and besides, do you think you're greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water 
then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Oops, I don't have a husband. The woman replied, Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and this dude you're shacked up with now is not your husband. You certainly spoke the truth. Calls her out. Jesus, that's not very nice. Why are you making this awkward? I mean, she was on the hook, man. And then here you go calling her out like that. What's that about? So tell me. Oh, wait. (laughs) Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. This is a sharp one here. Um, So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman. The time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, well, I know the Messiah is coming. The one who uh, who is called Christ, when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Let's pray. Jesus, would would you walk into the room? We welcome you. Bring living water in this place. We come thirsty. And we're tired. Would you meet us at the point of our need and fill us? Thank you for your presence. Thank you that you're here. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Have you come to hear from God today? Yes. I hope you do. I hope you show up with expectation. God, what do you have for me today? I'm excited to worship you, but I also need a word. What do you have for me today? Uh, man, I, I, that's how, I mean, that's how I come to church. Like, God, I just want to hear a word from you. Even if it's something you speak that might be something separate from what the speaker is saying, but God just to be in the environment where there's worship and you're being honored. God, let your voice be heard. And um, I'm just, I just love that. And so in this passage, and let, let me break down this passage for you a little bit. Um, so uh, Jews didn't normally travel through Samaria. In fact, they went out of their way to go around the long way to avoid because Jews and Samaritans uh, didn't get along. They didn't like each other. Uh, Uh, Jews especially didn't like Samaritans. That's why Jesus used the parable of the Good Samaritan, because he's trying to break down these walls. Uh, He's trying to uh, prove a point. But Jesus is the Savior of all peoples. He's the Savior of the world, not just the Jews. And so, But salvation comes through the Jews, but for the whole world. And so he says, "I, I have to go through Samaria. And so he goes, and he sits down. He's tired, but this is the reason that he's there. And then this woman comes out. In, at noon, at the hottest part of the day, and notice that nobody else is there. No one else is there to get water. Why? Because they come out in the morning. The, the ladies come out early in the morning before the heat of the day to get water and then take it back so they don't have to be out in the heat of the day. But here comes this woman in the heat of the day alone to get water. Why? Because she's ashamed. Because she's been ostracized. Because her community has made her uh, feel like they're not part of the community because of her sin. And so she comes out alone because she's tired of abuse. She's tired of the shame, but she's still bearing it. And so she comes out to get water, and there is Jesus sitting there waiting for her. And so... He has come out of his way in the heat of the day. He's tired. 
He's probably hungry. And he's, he's, he's met this woman who is considered the worst of the worst. And there he sits at the well. And he's waiting for her. And then he opens up a conversation. He doesn't start with like, uh, hey, I'm Jesus, the Messiah. You want to get saved? By the way, this passage is a blueprint for how to share your faith with people. I'm not going to go into that today. But he begins talking to her. And he says, you know, he's, he's, he's building a bridge based on a common connection of this water that she's coming to get. And he's like, you know what? If you ask me, I'd give you living water. He said, oh, God, be great. I don't have to come out here like this in the daytime anymore. I, give me that, that living water. That sounds great. Sign me up. And then Jesus says, well, hey, go get your husband and bring him here. Oh, what? Jesus, you're blowing it, man. I mean, she was ready to raise her hand. She's ready to come to the altar like, give me some of that living water. But he calls her out because here's the thing. Sin matters. We just took communion. It cost the body and blood of Jesus to pay the price for your sin. Jesus didn't wink at sin. He didn't sidestep it. He was confronting her on it in a way that was grace-filled, but he didn't ignore it. He says, before you get to the point where you can have this living water, we have to talk about this problem. And so he talks to her, and, and, and you know, she's like, whoa, there's something going on here. There's, there's, you know, you, God has revealed something to you. And then, you know, uh, what's John 4.13 say? I think I have the, the slide, the next slide there. Uh, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. So she was looking for a temporary fix to her situation. She just wanted to like, just fix this current situation. I don't want to have to come out here in the heat of the day and get this water again. So like what you're saying sounds like I can get around this problem, but Jesus wanted to, to go through the problem to the root of it, and that's why he's talking about springs of living water. That's why he confronted her about her, uh, her history, her past, her patterns. Um, and then she starts talking about the belief differences. Well, you Jews, and you know, we Samaritans, and, and so, you know, people today like to talk about beliefs. They do. They, they like to, uh, you know, they like to come off as spiritual. They like to talk about beliefs. And, and so the Samaritan woman tried to st- sidestep this whole living water and... Uh, you know, marital situation, you know, and, and started talking about, she wanted to, to, to descend into arguments about beliefs. I mean, she basically was jumping on Facebook here and be like, well, hey, you know, you guys believe that, we believe this. And so, and then, you know, are you greater than our father Jacob? And, and so here's the thing. She had some beliefs But remember, she's been ostracized by her community. She wasn't even walking according to her beliefs, but yet she had beliefs. So her beliefs did not impact her life to the point of change, but she had some beliefs. She was spiritual. She knew history. She knew the spiritual language. She went to church when she was a kid, after all. She went to Sunday school. She learned, you know, Pastor Kerry was teaching her the Bible stories. And I know our ancestor, Jacob, he's the one that made this well. So she has the lingo down. She has the terminology down. But she's not following any of it. And she grew up around people who know the language but she's not living it. It's kind of like this bucket. You like my bucket? This isn't it a nice bucket? I mean, I mean, Home Depot bucket. Like these things are so useful, right? But here's what I want you to do. I want you to pretend it's a metaphor. Go with it. It's an illustration. Pretend this bucket is God for a moment, okay? filled with the infinite resource that he has. 
His character, His power, His knowledge, His love. It's infinite. But we're pretending this container carries such a thing. And so we, we, we look at the bucket. We're, we're comfortable analyzing the bucket, measuring the bucket. We talk about the bucket like we know it personally. We talk about the bucket even like we made it. Oh, yeah, that's pressed in a, that's made up of chemicals, of plastic, and the machine. And the, so we, we act like we know. Uh, sometimes we'll gold plate it because, you know, it's, it's, it's God and we're going to put gold on it. Um, oh, look, this bucket. It's like a circle and it's like it goes on forever. It's eternal. Let's talk about the eternal circle of God and his infinite and blah, 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 blah. Oh, look, that's not just orange. It's angelic orange. Yeah, yeah. And look at this. It's not just a handle. It's a holy handle. It's so good. It's the holy sepulcher of the depot. It's the, it's, um, maybe you know the patron saint, St. Homer Depot. I think we have a picture of this, this patron saint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a French saint, you know, obviously. Homer Dipo, um, you know, honored saint. And so we, we talk to the saint because we're more comfortable talking to figures and figurines rather than the God who paid everything so he could be connected to us personally. Saint Homer Dipo, watch over my children. <laughs> You know, we're comfortable with talking about the bucket because we're not invested in it. We do everything to avoid personal interaction or accountability. We function in the vague hope of being saved one day. Maybe my good depot works will outweigh my bad Lowe's works one day. I guess we'll just have to see how it all plays out. You know, I'm just kind of hoping maybe I'm 51% depot as opposed to my 49% lows. That's how people treat their salvation. Like it's a gamble. Maybe I'll be good enough. I got a newsflash for you. You will never be good enough for heaven. You will never be good enough for heaven. You, you cannot earn heaven you will never, you have broken God's laws. The wages of sin is death. If you've broken one, you've broken all of them. You'll never be good enough. There's only one who's good enough, and he paid the price for us. That's the whole message of the gospel. But as I play this game with my eternity, Maybe, you know, maybe my life is out of control and maybe I am burdened down by shame. But I have beliefs. I believe in God. The Samaritan woman, she had a certain spirituality. She had a certain knowledge of God. But the only way it impacted her life was some sort of vague, unreliable hope about somebody named Messiah that was going to be coming one day to tell her things as if it's an informational problem. She was the worst of the worst. And that was the whole point. That was the very reason Jesus was there, to seek her out. A despised Samaritan, a woman who at the time women were looked down upon. And he, that's why the disciples came back. What are you talking about that with that woman for? especially a Samaritan woman. He was spending time with her, valuing her. The, the, the focus of God the Son who, who made all things in the universe was focused on this one woman who was considered the worst of the worst. He had her captive with his attention, an outcast among her own. And here Jesus sits waiting for her in compassion 
to tell her how her life can completely change if, if she responds to what he's saying. You know, like the Samaritan woman, our, our culture views God as out there. Someday. I believe, I have beliefs. It's a part of my life. I'm spiritual after all. Let me show you a little graph thing that I've come up with that I think will um, illustrate this. This is how our culture views the things of God. Uh, it views Christianity, religion, and so on. Um, you see, we've got the career space. We've got that. Uh, the pie is us, right? You know, And so we've got, oh, that, that's my career, and that's my family, and this part's my finance. Got to take care of my future, you know, and... Uh, uh, you know, there's entertainment budget, you know, and, and, and oh, you know, there's, there's the little spiritual sliver there. That's part of my life. I am spiritual after all. And, and so that kind of just makes up who I am, you know. I, I believe there's a God, and occasionally, you know, I, I visit a church, or, you know, I believe, but I'm busy, and, you know, I have kids, and blah, 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 blah. blah. And so <clears throat> this is the picture of how people approach God and their life, the interaction between God and their life. It's neatly partitioned with very clear-cut borders. It's the view of God and faith and religion and Christianity, at least the Christianity of people that don't really know him. They only know about him. They have a certificate from Sunday school when they were a kid, they went to a camp, they had an experience. Oh, I know God. Back at the campfire when I was 12. This is the view espoused by uh, certain branches of our government that believe that religion belongs in church buildings only. Just shut up and keep it inside your church. It's the view of people who don't understand what Jesus taught at all. but occasionally they want to throw a religious bone towards God every once in a while, and the rest of the time focus on being in control of their lives and trying to be a good person. After all, I need my Home Depot works to outweigh my bad Lowe's works. So I'll throw God a bone every once in a while, try and balance things out a little bit. But does all this sound like what Jesus was trying to describe to this woman, where like rivers of living water would bubble up out of your being, does it sound like that at all? There's a real discrepancy between this view and what Jesus was talking about. Was he picturing an interaction with him that through the ages uh, would keep him locked into a certain corner of your heart, locked and, and, and build walls around a certain part of your life? Jesus, please stay there. I've got to focus on work right now. Partitioned into your life. Did Jesus die for 20% of your life? Have you ever seen the difference between someone who has this sectioned off view of God versus somebody who does have rivers of living water flowing from within them? Have you seen that difference? Usually it's something like, oh, well, they're pretty religious. No, they just understand what Jesus was teaching and they've opened themselves up, say, God, give me what you have for me, all of it. Is Christianity supposed to be boring? You don't trust Him to the point of inconvenience and danger because you don't even really know Him. You haven't surrendered to Him. And so you keep this sectioned off view. You're firmly in control of your own life. But Jesus wants all of it. Trust me. I'm going to lead you through some things that are going to freak you out. But it's for your benefit. It'll be hard. But trust me. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. I already showed you how much I love you. Trust me. Are our lives supposed to be marked by shame and chains of bondage like the Samaritan woman? Dead, dry religion 
leaves people powerless and disillusioned. No wonder. I would walk away from that too. God's out there somewhere, but he doesn't really care. People walk away from this type of faith, but this this distant God that has been cooked up is 180 degrees from the God of the Bible who gave everything just to draw near to you and actually live inside of you and walk through everything with you. What happened? What I want to show you today is, and what Jesus successfully communicated to this woman, is the way of Jesus. And I'm going to do it with an illustration of some principles that I've already mentioned. Uh, If you remember, I talked about the five C's. I think I have a slide for that that we'll follow along. But uh, I want to work through it. As you see, I've got the bowls here and so on. um, And I'm going to illustrate that as we go forward. But I, I want you to be listening and, and doing self-examination as we walk through this. Um, you know, so we have the picture here, right? And so this is what I'm going to fill those bowls with. But um, this is Christ, okay? Uh, Christ came to where we're at, bringing the infinite resource of God. He dips into the deep things of God, and then he brings them to us. And he did that through the cross. And so, of course, there's infinite here, but it's just an illustration. So Jesus told us that apart from him, we can do what? That's what the Bible says. I found that offensive for a, a time in my life. What you talking about? Oh, yeah, I can do stuff. I can, I can do things. Um, I'm not, you know, I can do some stuff. Um, but really, as I've gotten older, I'm not old, but as I've gotten older, um, I've seen this not only in my life, but in the lives of people around me, that apart from him, it all starts to fall apart. I can, do th- I can do temporary things. Apart from him, things spiral into chaos. Apart from him, it shrivels and dies. Apart from him, your relationships will grow toxic. Out of him flows life into us. It's not a belief in him, but it's an actual life-giving relationship with him. He comes into our hearts and lives there with us. He's not out there somewhere, some distant God who doesn't care. He paid the ultimate price so that he could be with us. And the language that the Bible uses is one of passionate personal pursuit. He had an appointment that day with an outcast. He broke every law that there was so that he could meet with her and talk with her in a personal way. Jesus wasn't trying to get her to believe in the bucket. She believed in the bucket, but she, he was getting her to a point where she was ready to receive the contents of the bucket The living water is the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And the whole language that he uses with Nicodemus about being born again, it is a transformation. She's looking at her circumstances and how can I just kind of smash God into my current circumstances. But God doesn't, he's not interested in trying to fit into your little sections of pies and whatever. He wants it all. It's going to change everything. God, can you do this in my little life? Because I'm living a very small life apart from you, but I want you to bless it because it leaves me in control, and I don't want you to mess with things because I'm working really hard even though it's a crazy, toxic mess. But, Lord, I'm comfortable with it, and I don't want to change, and I'm afraid of what you might ask me to do. So, God, could you just bless this? So we have to start with Christ. He's the one that brings the infinite resource of God to us, We can't go and get it apart from a relationship with him. We have to go through Christ. It's in Christ. Every blessing, every promise that we have as Christians is in Christ. If you are outside of Christ, you have no access to this. So, 
What we do is we have our little lists, right? Where are my list makers at? My OCD folks, come on, All right? You have your hopes, your dreams about, <clears throat> about your life, about your, your, your companion, you know, your spouse, your children, your church career. You're like, man, I just really hope, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, white picket fence. Come on, God, do it. Do it. Even though I'm not listening to you about anything else, just give me what I want. Just give me what I want. Give me the perfect marriage. Even though it's outside of you and he doesn't even believe in you or follow you. But God, I just give it to me. Our ideas, our hopes, our dreams, right? Invest, invest. I'm going to get what I want if I just keep investing. And we just fill, we fill our bowls. And this isn't even all the bowls. This is just a representation of a few bowls. But, um, but we fill them with our wants, our hopes, our desires. But... If this is Christ bringing the, uh, you know, the picture is Christ bringing the infinite resource of God to us. You know the way that you get what you really want? You empty yourself. You come to God with all your little hopes, your plans, your designs, your mess, and you say, God empty. I die to myself. I've wrecked everything that I've tried to do apart from you. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. The way to follow Jesus is a way of dying to ourselves, not trying to stuff him into our little labels, our little ideas. We die to ourselves. That's why this label game that's going on out there is just ridiculous. I'm a blank Christian. There's no such thing as a fill-in-the-blank Christian. There's just Christian. You're dead. You come alive in Christ, and He is your identity. He is your label. So we empty ourselves of our designs and our hopes and our dreams because they're so small compared to what He wants to give us. In high school, man, I didn't even have a clue. I was chasing all the wrong things. And I had no idea what God was going to be bringing into my life if I would just stop messing around and empty myself. And so we start with Christ as a pitcher. And, uh, and so that's... It's our container, and he, do, he comes and he brings us, and he fills. But some of us only kind of want just enough, right? God, don't mess with my life, but I don't want to go to hell. I, just, I need a little fire insurance, God. Could you just kind of do that, but then just leave me alone? And so, guess what he does? He honors your wishes. He respects you. Okay, but if you really knew him, if, if, if you really got what he's trying to tell the Samaritan woman, he said, man, you just, what are you doing? You're playing in the garbage when I just have such blessing and just incredible blessing to give you. What are you doing? You're settling so, for so far less of what I've created you for. If you would just trust me. And so hopefully you've made that decision where you're like, God, everything you want for me is what I want for me. I trust you. Fill me to the fullest. God, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. Everything you want, bring it, bring it. That's when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I began to speak in other tongues. I began to just, it was just a whole other level in my life. God, everything you want, every blessing, every gift, give it to me. I want it. I trust you. I've seen what I've done with my life. Give me everything you've got. Amen. And it transformed me. And then 
we have companion, which is just a C word for our spouse, our husband, or wife. You're right that you have no husband. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. God doesn't bypass this. He says, do things my way. Do them the right way, because I have blessing on the other side of that. When you honor me, you will not regret it. You will find everything you hoped for. You will stop being afraid all the time. Do it my way. So we had the Love and Respect Conference this weekend. We learned some great tools to help us understand each other. But what I appreciated most uh, was how he brought it together at the end by saying that apart from Christ, it's just not going to work. It's not meant to be applied apart from a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot give your wife unconditional love living with a walled-off, compartmentalized view of God. You cannot give your husband unconditional respect with a superficial connection to Jesus. You just can't do it. You don't have the resource to do it. It's hard. But there's still a longing in our hearts for the type of fulfillment that only God can provide. But apart from Him, we're always trying to pull out of the ones around us what only God can give us. And you're wrecking things. Because nobody else can give you what only God can give you. And so, we say, God, flow into, pour into my marriage. Make it yours. Use it for your glory. And then we have our children. Our children are suffering, y'all. They're under attack. Literally every form of media and education is trying to tell them that God is not who he says he is, and and they are not who he created them to be. The framework of everything that's being presented to them denies these things. Tell me, do you think that dead, dry religion is what our children need? Well, it's what I was taught, and I learned this way, and like... Did it, is it really working out for you? This superficial connection to a God you don't really know. It's all about values. But it's not rivers of living water. And you want to give that to your kids when you can't even stand it? Do they simply need to be educated about the bucket? Angelic orange. Holy handle. (laughs) St. Omer de Pau. Or maybe, maybe instead of learning about the bucket, maybe have parents in a church that has the contents of the bucket flowing in and through them to touch their lives. Then we have church. You know, some folks like to focus on the kingdom of God as a whole, you know, the big C church around the world. That's awesome. Uh, But they focus on it only because they've been disappointed in the past. They've been hurt in the past. Pastor said something he didn't like. Um, Somebody in the church was mean to me. And so... They give to you know, their favorite TV preachers or, or charities instead of sowing their tithe into the local storehouse because they've allowed offense to separate them from what God has intended for them. You that quiet, that attention, that's good stuff right there. You know, we have to raise money to take care of needed updates in our house because we don't have it right now. And I get it. 2020 was rough, y'all. Totally get that. But things like the projector and the screen, we have to do updates. We have to. We have to modernize. We have to invest in technology. But we just don't have it right now, so we have to raise money. But I think we could have it. You know, the tithes, the the offerings above the tithe, uh, missions offerings, that's all stuff that should come to the house. The local storehouse, 
Um, and, and so this idea of focusing on the big C church and the kingdom of God and all these things that really you are keeping at a distance, they're not really intimately connected with you in your life. It's basically a cop-out because it keeps you comfy in your own little bubble. God has called us to be deeply connected in a local church. Period. Put the T on the end of that. Get some hood on that. Period. You even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, Tuesday night prayer we have here, and uh, just a, a few of us, um, but I always find it valuable. We meet with God, we worship, we pray, and most often the feedback I hear is, wow, that hour went by quick. Um, but at Tuesday night prayer, you know, I've been as praying and walking around praying in the spirit, I've constantly been seeing pictures of water flowing up and down the aisles and through the through the seats and the ropes. And we need that. You know, I don't, I don't value the Word of God simply because it's the Word of God. I value the Word of God because I know the author who wrote it. I had an experience with him that awakened my heart. And I wanted to learn everything I could about him. You know, collectively, we can accomplish so much more than we could apart. I don't care how much God has blessed you with or whatever. If you're doing it in your own little circle, you are so, you're living such a small life compared to what God has designed for you. Has God given you a skill? There's no higher place to apply it than in the kingdom of God and His church. You know, I've been reading about the craftsmen for the tabernacle in the wilderness and then later the temple in Jerusalem and how God uh, anointed craftsmen of skill. It was, it was skill and anointing to work together to build a house for His presence. What has God gifted you with? Skilled workers and craftsmen who apply their gifting, their knowledge, their trade to create an awesome place to worship. People like Andy Schultz. He's like, stop talking about me. Andy Schultz who crawled in the ceiling to put those lights in in the stairway so we could have a fun stairwell for the kids on the way to kids' church. You just come in and be like, ooh, things happened, Yay. It's like a God thing, right? Angels do that. No, it's people, it's people that work hard and sacrifice. And it looks awesome. You know what? I still haven't seen an invoice for the work or their supplies either. And there's more. I, I'm just highlighting one person. And he's probably not happy. <laughs> there's more but we need even more God's going to do something in this house but we need more and then career you know men particularly we define ourselves by what we do first question we ask when meeting somebody right What do you do? We find our identity in that. But uh, our definition in this and in all things, you know, even in our career, uh, should be Christ and his purpose for us. That should define even our career, men or women. It should define our our relationship with, because he created us. We're here because of his purposes. And if you're disconnected from that purpose, 
you're just kind of floundering around. I mean, I'm sure you're doing great work, but apart from him, you can do nothing. Don't you want what you invest your time and energy and skill into to last for eternity? If it dies when you die, you've done nothing. What if we stop viewing our jobs as just a way to pay bills and more as a daily assignment to bring his kingdom and where he sends us? You know, this is about understanding that your 80 times or so around the sun is just a speck compared to eternity. You're alive right now for a purpose. It's about you knowing and flowing in the specific design and purpose that you were created for. And there is an order for this. It is a priority order. So, you know, Christ is the pitcher, and he dives into the deep things of God. And so he brings living water into our marriage relationship, into our relationship with our kids, into our church connections, and the kingdom of God, into our career and so he brings water to those, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 you're not enough. To fill, like if I used this, it's not enough to fill all these bowls and plus the ones that aren't pictured. It's not enough. So how do we get living water in every area of our life? I'll show you how. This is the graph. This is God's design. He pours and he pours and he pours and he pours. And he keeps pouring, and it overflows, and it overflows, it overflows. Oh, man, it's been a rough week, rough month. Man, I need to go get some worship. I'm beat. Worship. Get filled, get filled. Paul says, be continually filled by the Holy Spirit. And so as we draw nearer and we keep surrendering more of our lives to him, he keeps filling. Oh, it's touching our it's touching our children now, and it's just flowing into them. I don't have to just, it's less rules now because God's writing their laws in, in, his, in their hearts, and it's flowing into the church, man. The, the relationships in the church have become life-giving, and, and it's healthy, and it's good, and it's a place where I'm applying what God has given me, and then, oh, it's overflowing into my career, and I'm walking into work like, hey, there's something different about you right now. I don't know what it is, but you've got something different on you. And more and more and more. Overflow, 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 overflow. That's the picture. I'm not going to go further. I don't want a big hunk and mess there, but that's the picture of God filling us to overflowing. Overflow. We don't stop with us. It's our, our faith is not something that's private, something that's separate from our, the rest of our lives. It's an overflow. God, let it flow into my relationship with my wife. God, help me to serve her like only you can enable me to do because I get tired and I get frustrated but God, I, when I think about what you've done for me and how you served me and you, the picture of service, and I just, honey, I love you. Tell me what I can do. I'm going to be patient. And then when you've got that going and, and she responds to the love that I'm giving her that I didn't have, but God gave me a resource because I don't always feel like loving, come on. And so, uh, and then that comes back in respect and just this, this blessing, this circle of blessing and health. And then, oh, wait a minute, my kids are seeing this. They're saying like, hey, things aren't perfect all the time, but they're seeing how mom and dad can reconcile and how they love each other and pray together. And like, oh, overflow, 
there's something happening in the house, and like they're picturing, they're seeing it, it's happening, and like, and then the church, you come to church ready to worship because you've already been worshiping at home. You're ready that the only word you get is not and Sunday, but you've been reading the Word all week long. You come and you're already filled. Like, let me pour out myself in service around here. Overflow, overflow, overflow. Not separate, not distinct, not boundaries from each other, but overflow. That is the design and the picture of God. I'm going to have the team come on back up. I'm going to close and... Uh, with one song here in worship, or longer, I don't know. But uh, it is God's will to fill you. And if what I'm talking about is something different than what you've experienced, I want you to know that there's more available to you. Maybe it's what you've been taught. Maybe it was your understanding. Maybe it was your rebellion. Let's be honest. But God has more for you. It's God's design that his life not only fill you, but flow into every area of your life. Every command that he gives, he gives life and power and grace and love and resource and mercy to fill. Every area, every bowl, life flowing into you and out through you. It's transformational. A river flowing from his throne that only gets wider and deeper the further that it goes out. So my question is this, who's thirsty? Because the wells that you keep going to only leave you wanting more. There might be a temporary satisfaction that comes. And that's sin, it does satisfy for a moment, but it leaves you worse off. It leaves you more thirsty than when you were, than when you began. But the waters, Jesus says, that I offer will become a spring of living water flowing up inside of you. And the longer you stay in my presence, the longer you stay connected to me, the more you surrender to me. It's a process. It's a journey. But the more you do that, it's going to start flowing into every area of your life. It's not an immediate thing. It takes time. You got a lot of crap inside of you. But that water, it's flowing. It's flowing. It's pushing out all the garbage. It's flowing. It's flowing. It's flowing. Would you stand with me? <sighs> Who's thirsty? Raise your hand if you want. That's okay. When I talk about living water, who's thirsty? I mean, who just like, you know what? I don't even care if somebody sees me raising my hand. Don't give a rip right now. I'm just thirsty and I want this. Who's tired of stale, dead, dry religion and senses in this house that there's something more? And by the teachings of Jesus, there's something more. And I feel like I'm just disconnected, like I'm just trying on my own. But if there's more, I want more. Let me ask you this. If you would, if you could, just bow your heads and close your eyes. I told you that you can't go to the living waters by yourself. You have to go through Jesus, and that's a relationship you saw where Jesus brought up the sin and, and dealt with the sin and says, I want to give you this, but you've got to deal with the sin issue in your heart. And so if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord because you've been trying to do it on your own and not go through Him in relationship, and you say, I'm just tired of doing this. You say, today... Today, I want to make things right. I want to go through Jesus and the gift that he provided. I want to go through the cross. If you're here and that's you, would you raise your hand up? Don't worry about anybody else. Just raise your hand up. Say, I just, I just need Jesus. I don't even give a flip on what anybody else thinks. 
I just need Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You put your hands down. Thank you, Lord. Secondly, if you're here and, you know, you do have this relationship with Jesus, but things have just been bone dry lately. And I get it. 2020 has been rough. 2021, not a whole lot better. And you just say, Lord, I just, oh, I just need water. I'm like crawling through the desert. I trust you, but God, I need you. I need more in this moment. So I'm opening myself up to you because I'm thirsty. If you're here today and that's you, would you just wave your hand before the Lord and say, I'm going to stand under the spout where that glory comes out, God. Come on and bring it. I just need it. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, I thank you for every hand that's been raised. I pray that you meet them just like you did the woman at the well, that you speak to them with kindness, with compassion, but also confrontation. God, that you speak to them about what they need to do and what you're trying to get them to surrender so that you can bring blessing and life into their life. God, help them to surrender. Lord, maybe they're saved, but they haven't really made you Lord of their life, and that's why they're struggling all the time. God, would you bring that? Would you bring the moment of surrender? We thank you, God, for meeting with us today. We're going to sing this one song. Uh, it's very uh, appropriate. All who are thirsty, come to the fountain, living waters. And then as soon as we're done with the song, I'll come back up and we'll pray and dismiss.